Hello, and welcome to episode three of V in the Wild. I am delighted to have back Thorny Justice, my co-blogger extraordinaire, and we are here to again talk to you about Baraboo, our favorite subject. How are you, Thorny? I am so good, and it is great to be back with you. There's um, no shortage of things to talk about, obviously. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Me too. So <clears throat> we got an interesting communication mm. uh, from someone after our last episode. We did. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit and go back and um, go through some of the things that were added to what we said mm. uh, last time, because I think it's really interesting. So you, you, you all in listener land are about to get an exclusive because I do not believe any of this information is out in the public yet. So here we go. We're going to start with the downtown Baraboo sign. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So this person who... Um, sort of is in a position to know certain things, um, contacted us and told us, uh, you and I had been talking, well, let me just back up because you and I had been talking about this Baraboo sign for a while yes, and the different aspects of, you know, what probably is symbolic here, the, you know, the wavy river lines, the, um, the circus wagon wheel, which is probably a wheel of bondage. Um, and then, um, I, I contacted you, I don't know, maybe like a, a couple of weeks or maybe two or three weeks ago. And I said, you know, I think those double, those, those O's at the end of Baraboo, those linked O's are, are something, I don't know what. Um, but then you had been writing about um, like a railroad fraternity or a railroad order that um, had like a chain as part of its um, symbology. Yeah, the brotherhood and, of the brotherhood of railroad train men, I think is. Yeah. Title, right. Yeah. Right. And I thought, well, you know, Baraboo was kind of a big deal with the train for a while. So maybe that's, you know, some sort of allusion to that. And I bounced that off of you. And you said, well, I don't know. I think maybe it's the odd fellows. And I went, oh, that's also a really good possibility. And um, and then I started to look at the fact that those those linked O's are next to that uh, wagon wheel. And I thought, well, maybe that's a third link in some sort right. of weird way. Yeah. And this person who communicated with us absolutely confirmed that that is how one should look at it is right. the the yep. two linked O's with the wagon wheel. So that was like amazing to find out. But then it went even deeper because this person said those aren't really O's. They're not really letters in the way that you and I would think about them. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, they're Samex. They're Hebrew letters. The fifteenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and one plus five equals six. So the three. O's together, when you take it with that wagon wheel, that's a 666. Yep. Crazy. And crazy is right. Amazing. I'm not much for gematria. I, I do have someone who's agreed to come on the show at some point who is a gematria expert mm. um, and kind of teach us maybe some of the basics because I'm not very good at it at all. But yeah, that's pretty amazing. So the, the this, however you pronounce that Hebrew um, Samek, Samek, I'm not sure. I think it's so uh, Samek, but Samek, yeah, I'm not, Samek. I'm no expert. <clears throat> right. So back to this, this sign. So that's literally a 666 notification right. to anybody who knows to read it, um, on that, on the end of that sign, Baraboo. And you have to wonder because you did some digging into the, the name of the town and it yeah. used to be something different and they changed it to Baraboo. I wonder if they specifically changed it so that they could literally signal that particular um, triple chain at the end. Oh, that's such an interesting possibility. I hadn't even considered that. Um, it's true that uh, when Baraboo was first platted, um, there were, I was actually, in our last episode, I said that there was an older part of town and a newer part of town. And I, I said that the, uh, older part was down by the train depot. I actually have done some more research on that and I was wrong. So I'd like to correct that right now. Um, mm -hmm. the, the two, there were two plats originally, um, one that was essentially platted by the County of Sauk. Um, there was a kind of a rich guy who bought the land and then made it possible for, um, the County to have it, uh, or purchase it. And then they platted and sold lots on that plat. And that's the plat, um, that where the courthouse is, um, ah, oh, it was, okay. yeah. And it's really interesting, right? Because in Baraboo, you have an East street and a West street 
And those were the outer, the outer eastern and western bounds of that original plat, basically. Mm. And then it went down, um, I think it went up to maybe like, it might have gone up to 5th or 6th Street or Avenue now. Um, but uh, the, the bottom of it was kind of along the northern edge of Water Street, where the circus ended up being built up, you know, the Ringling Brothers, uh, they call it Ringlingville, um, where all their buildings were. And, um, and then the second plat was, um, the south side of water street and everything on the other side of the river. Well, not everything, but like a bunch of stuff on the other side of the river and the Northern plat where the courthouse is was called Adams. And the Southern plat was Baraboo from the very beginning. And, uh, ultimately the, um, there was a decision to merge them into one community and they called it, um, I think Brooklyn for a little while, a lot of, a lot of the settlers in Wisconsin were Yankee settlers. So they came from further East and were naming things after places that were near and dear to their hearts. Um, so they called it Brooklyn for a little while, but that was not at all a popular decision. Um, there was a lot of outcry about it. And so they ended up in fairly short order, renaming it Baraboo, which was, was far more popular. So the fact that you're asking, is that maybe, uh, was that an intentional decision because they could represent it in a certain way? That yeah. uh, it's a possibility. Well, maybe all that outcry and consternation about the old name was just about what they could signal. That may be. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Wasn't it also called Gem City at some point? Didn't I hear you say that? Yes. Yeah, so it got this nickname. And the official story, I did a little digging on that too. I was trying to figure out when did that come in and where and how. Um, but the way that that came in, at least according to the official narrative, is that the courthouse square, I mean, they from the very beginning when they platted Adams, um, which became you know part of Baraboo, uh, they had it in mind. They had this uh, central square in mind where they wanted to put the courthouse, but they didn't do that for a long time. For a long time, it was just sort of a green common area, uh -huh. and um, and the the city fathers didn't really and the county didn't really do much to keep it up. I mean, it was like kind of a kind of a mess from what I understand, and so a lot of um, citizens, women, you know, uh, in particular, I think took it upon themselves to clean up the square and make it something beautiful. And, um, the, the, the name gem city supposedly comes out of the fact that they made that square, like a gem in the middle of yeah, the city. Right. I think I remember reading something about that. They planted a lot of flowers and bushes mm -hmm. and they, yeah. they, they linked that to gem, which, they could have called it Flower Square. <laughs> right. <laughs> they didn't really have to call right. it Gem, Gem City because Gem certainly has a different connotation inside the Brotherhood. It's a, that, that would be a, another calm, you know, communication between them as to what, what was going on probably underneath this. Yeah, I really want to know what's underneath this whole entire yeah. town at this point because I think I think we've got some some mirrored stuff, you know. Mirrored stuff yeah. happening. And, and that was one of the other things that actually, let me go up to this. Well, I guess I, the way I've got this, this structured, that doesn't come next. Um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll hold that thought. We'll hold that thought because this will come up. You know, this is part of the problem of doing a PowerPoint that having these images is great, but it sure doesn't facilitate the, the mental flow. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah, so I put together this slide because I, I, you know, I didn't know much about Odd Fellowship. I learned a bit here and there. I found a book that was really interesting about, you know, the history of the Odd Fellows, which is not something I really knew anything about. But then I found this, the photo that's in the middle of this slide, the primer, the Odd Fellows primer, which is out mm. of uh, California. And the imagery on this is just astonishing because it connects sure to a lot of different stuff. Um, it's got the three chain links on it, which is the typical Odd Fellows symbol. Usually, they're linked like that. Usually, they're they're not unlinked. Like the the, the Baraboo sign has the last one, is not linked to the two O's, but I guess it's you know implied. Right. And if you're a member of the Odd Fellows, I guess that would be understood. Most of the time, you see it like these three linked chains. And then I saw a bunch of other symbols on the front of this that were just like mind blowing to me. One is the and I still don't know how to pronounce this correctly. I think it's 
fas- fasces? Fasces, um, I think. Fasces, yeah. which is a bundle of sticks, and it's bound with cord. And sometimes, and sometimes it has an axe in the center of it, and sometimes it doesn't. And we see that in this on the on the front of this Oddfellows primer, right? So three link chains, then the fasces, then the three link chains, and the fasces on the right and the left side. Um, and the, the, this symbol is really interesting because it's all over the place. So on the very mm. left of this slide, that's a picture where it says France, and then the fasces is underneath it with the priestess laurels surrounding it. That's one. That's the center part of um, what I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, which is the the ornamentation on some of these circus wagons in the yeah. in the circus museum. Um, astonishing. So that that's there, and then you see it all over the place in other symbology. Like it's big with Knights of Columbus. It's on the state of Colorado sigil, and it is a symbol for power. It's for punishment, power, jurisdiction. And it's identified with fascism and Hitler and Mussolini. So, well, all great things, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, Sign me up. Get me one of those for my wall. <laughs> but it's a power symbol, and I think that's how how they use it within within the system. I mean, we know in Colorado, one of the main doms is is you know the the new Babylon. Essentially, it's a main central hub for the Brotherhood. So mm-hmm. that kind of makes sense that it's on the on the Colorado sigil. Oh, sure. um, but I was really surprised that it's on the front of this Oddfellows primer because that, that to me means that the Oddfellows are much more important than I would have thought before. Uh, and that was, yeah. And that was also something that was confirmed by this communication to the both of us that, that Oddfellows are big in the Baraboo area and they yeah. also are, uh, you know, they're going to contain a lot of the high level nights, uh, or high level priestess, priestesses and priests are going to be a part of this particular group, which I would not have pegged and you wouldn't have either. I no, don't think. I would not. And I'll tell you why I would not have. The individual who contacted us basically said that the two big groups uh, that would be controlling things in Baraboo would be the Rotarians and the Oddfellows. And that, I mean, it did, it just shocked the living daylights out of me because you don't, I mean, there is maybe some of that, like there's a, um, there was an odd fellows hall established in Baraboo. They actually tried to establish it, charter it in 1851, really, really early in Baraboo's history. And it didn't get very far. Um, but I think they were still kind of plugging along even without a charter. Uh, and then in 1871, uh, they did charter an Odd Fellows uh, lodge in Baraboo, but the thing is, uh, and and it was bigger than the the Masons in Baraboo for a while. Like if you look at the, I've got an 1879 or 80 Sauk County history that gives like a lot of really interesting information about uh, secret societies that were, um, I mean, very proudly, you know, I mean, like th- this was a like a great civic thing to do, apparently in the minds of the people who did this. Um, history, yeah. but um, it basically says that there were like I think 125 odd fellows at the time of the publication to 108 masons. So I mean, the odd fellows were definitely bigger in Baraboo in, in in that period. But like, if you go to Baraboo now, they've got like a a weird little building uh, that's kind of on I guess it's Ninth Ninth Street, um, kind of back behind a local restaurant. Um, but it's like, it's super nondescript. You, you don't even know it's there. Nobody, nobody in Baraboo talks about the odd fellows. Nobody. Mm-hmm. You hear about yeah. the Masons a lot. You still hear about the Elks here and there, but you do not hear about the odd fellows. So, uh, and frankly, not a lot about the Rotarians either a bit maybe, but not a lot. Yeah. Um, Kiwanis is, is much bigger. Although I think Kiwanis and, um, the Rotarians may have sort of a, like a lock and key, um, right. relationship. But anyway, yeah. I, I, you know, it just, it just shocked me because they, nobody talks about, nobody talks about. Yeah. The but it makes, it makes perfect sense in the light of this idea that, um, these two groups are going to contain the upper level yeah. individuals in the brotherhood. And what we were told is that they're going to fall into the, the high priest and grand high priest or high priestess and grand high priestess status. So you're talking right. about a limited group. So in that sense, it certainly does. It makes perfect sense. These are the, the, the ones that want to keep hidden and yeah. 
and they're the upper upper level, so they're going to be much fewer of them. Right. And yeah. All right. So we will revisit the Odd Fellows uh, later as well. They keep mm. popping up, but I do want to point out too that that the front of this particular primer that's that's up there. I've got the two red boxes around the the wings. That indicates thelema, T H E L E M A, which is Aleister Crowley's version of black magic. Mm. Um, and there's some other interesting symbols on this as well. The Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail, uh, which is a, a cultural symbol, but across a number of different cultures for usually indicates Lucifer or Satan or high level demonics. And then you've got the, the all seeing eye above that and the, the rays of sunshine. And yeah, so mm-hmm. it's quite something that this particular it group is. that we don't know much about, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're still on. Um, we're st- we're still recapping from last time, and this is the inside of the Al Ringing Theater. Ringling Theater. I got this photo off of their uh, website, the one that that shows the restoration. So, um, very beautiful, very ornate theater. And the reason I put this here is because we were also told that there is. So, one of the things I asked on the last last podcast we did is. <laughs> what's underneath this theater because I really yes. felt like there was something there. There had to be. And then my thought was headed in the ritual direction. Turns out it's not a ritual location that's underneath its theater. It's another theater, a mirrored theater underground <laughs> with tiered seating. And this is where the big wigs have regional meetings underneath. So, Given that one of the people we're going to talk later seems to be a big wig, and we talked last time about how from his mansion to the underground of the Al Ringling Theater, there's a tunnel that now makes at least rumors. Sense. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. makes perfect sense. Yeah. So if you look at this theater, the kind of red velvet seating, etc., that uh, is here, and the ornateness, um, that's what is going to be underneath for the Brotherhood, for their regional meetings, which blew me away. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I was yeah. like, wow, how on are we? Jeez. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Well, pretty on, apparently. We were actually yeah. we were actually told that every single location we highlighted in the last video is confirmed use by the Brotherhood. So just astonishing. Decoding. Decoding. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so this yeah. is this is a close-up also from the um, restoration website of the interior of the theater around the top of the, the circular dome area. Yeah. Uh, all of these kind of uh, cherubium, Greek and Roman esque paintings. Um, and that has a specific meaning as well, according to our communique. Uh, it means that the individuals in this area who are odd fellows and Rotarians are also going to sit in the Knights of Pythias circles. Hmm. Knights of Pythias <laughs> was a group. When I looked at it, I thought, I don't, I don't get this group very much. You know, they've got all this. It's, it's a, it's a, a story about two men, and and they they hold each other up, and it's. I can see why the Brotherhood might use it, but Knights of Pythias, I've never heard of them before. This is just not a big group. You know, it doesn't seem like it's should be any big deal, but apparently it is because from everything I've seen so far. The Knights of Pythias show up at the top level of the Brotherhood over and over and over again. Right. So when you see this Greek and Roman art, that's one indication. It might be one indication that you're seeing Knights of Pythias. Interestingly, this Al Ringling Theater, and I'm going to turn it over to you after I say this, is actually, when I started looking it up after last time, it was built by the same group. It was designed by the same architect that uh, designed the Orpheum Theater in, um, I forget where. Uh, Is that Chicago? It's a, I think it's on the outskirts of Chicago. Yeah. Hmm. Or maybe near Milwaukee. I, okay. Oh, I I have forgotten entirely, but, um, but. Rap and rap were big. I know they were like really respected. So you have to wonder, I have to wonder, can you, can you design an entire building with a mirrored underground and be out of the loop about that? I'm not so sure. So I'm wondering if these similar designs indicate something similar in nature, like uh, is there under the Orpheum? Is there another theater under there? I don't know. And then we've got 
the the Versailles Theater, which mm-hmm. also ties in. So I'll let you take this. So the the Outer Link Theater was influenced uh, heavily. The design of it was influenced heavily by uh, the the opera at Versailles or theater. Uh, and um, that was built by Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, the the Palace of Versailles was always kind of under construction. They were always doing projects and changing things around. Um, but the the theater at Versailles, um, really called the Opéra, was um, they planned it for, from like seventeen, like the late seventeen forties. But there were all these wars and things that kind of got in the way, and not a lot of funds to to work with. And so. Uh, in 1763, they finally decided to pull the trigger and get this thing built. And in 1765, they actually started construction and they had it done uh, within five years in time for the wedding of Marie Antoinette and the grandson, I think it was the grandson of Louis the 15th, who became later Louis the 16th. And um, when you look at the theater for this uh, opera, um, you know, this when you look at the when you look at the, the opera ceiling, what you see is this remarkable um, trompe l'oeil painting. Um, that means fool the eye. If you have never heard that term before, it's designed to look like the ceiling just like literally goes up into the heavens. Um, and it's Apollo preparing the crowns for illustrious men of the arts. And I I just was sort of uh, blown away. I think you actually were the one who kind of pursued um, this image and yeah. um, started looking at it more closely. And I'd never, I, I mean, I've looked at the opera before, but I've never looked closely at that ceiling image or really knew what it was. And I was blown away when you came back to me and said, hmm, <clears throat> Apollo. Yeah. So. Apollo, Apollyon, Abaddon, all names for the same entity. Uh, Shiva is another, um, and they're all considered the destroyer. Not necessarily, not Lucifer himself, but something pretty close, a -hmm. very destructive demonic entity. Um, They call him the king of the angel of the abyss in Revelation. And they've, they've (laughs) yeah, on the ceiling of a theater, just kind of mind boggling. Yeah. And then it gets even weirder because I started, when you told me about that, I started digging uh, on a couple of other things and I found this painting by, uh, he was like really the, like Louis XIV's painter, um, Le Brun. And um, he did a painting for what was supposed to be the fourth chapel at Versailles. They um, had these successive chapels. None of them were quite good enough. And so they had to keep building or changing locations or whatever. And um, Le Brun did a, a sort of a workup of what should be on the ceiling of this chapel that never actually, it never got completed. It's a project that never got completed. Uh, but it was the fall of the rebel angels. That was the theme of the painting that was going to go on the fourth chapel ceiling. Wow. And that's pretty shocking. <laughs> yeah. So, so the Baraboo theater and the Orpheum, they're modeled after the Versailles theater and the, and the, the, you know, the crowning glory of the ceiling is an homage to death and destruction and, and, and to demons. So. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, all neatly yeah. cloaked. Right. I mean, because uh, one of the things that occurred to me when it said that uh, Apollo was was crowning these men or, um, you know, basically elevating these men of the of the arts or whatever, I thought, oh, the is that like the seven arts of the of Freemasonry? I think like, it's because um, don't they talk about seven arts? Yeah. Um, and I can't that there's a part of this communication that we can't publicly talk about at this point, mm. but the arts are definitely big and they're mm. big in connection to the brotherhood. Okay. So, yeah. So okay. th- this will all make sense probably a little later, but it's right. I think important to tie it in, tie it in now because it's, it's pretty huge. Great. Okay. Mm. Yep. I will wait patiently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So this last piece, nope, we got two, two more. This, this piece. So one of the things we got wrong last time, because who on earth could have guessed, um, was about the railroad and where it went to the railroad in Baraboo, despite the 
the the train um, depot being kind of run down, the railroad in Baraboo is actually still being used, we're told. And it connects to a very interesting place, which is the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin. In fact, it connects underneath. So there is a railroad hub Mm -hmm. underneath this railroad museum that goes at least to Baraboo and who knows where else, which I thought very, that's just very interesting. How how appropriate to build a museum on the, you know, the surface and then have the, the hidden activities going on right underneath it. Well, absolutely. And what I do know that the, um, like at least the above ground, um, uh, operations headquarters, uh, officially that was moved from Baraboo, um, to Madison, but that doesn't mean that that's where the underground hub was moved to. Right. You know, yeah. so they could wow. be making it look like things are happening in Madison when in fact they're happening somewhere else. Yep. The whole idea, frankly, to me of having an underground railroad hub. I mean, it makes sense. There's all sorts of transportation we've been told about underneath the surface. The Brotherhood does, you know, high speed trains, et cetera. But having actual more old style trains, if that, if that's what's actually going on underneath uh, the surface, that was something I hadn't thought about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Mm. All right. Last piece of this old puzzle is something I ran across this week when I was listening to part three of a nine-part series by William Schnebelin. Um, and he he made a really interesting point. And I thought, wow, I remember seeing, I went, where did I remember seeing the shape? Oh, yeah, in Baraboo. So this is, what is this, the old, what did you call it, the old inn? So this, uh, it was a hotel at one point. Um, mm-hmm. And I can't remember what the name of the hotel was. But then um, I think it's it was like the, the Baraboo in or something and then like for a while it was Dombrowski's but like maybe it is the Baraboo Inn now it could be the Baraboo mm. Inn now okay um, so yeah. yeah so if you look at the 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 roof style it's kind of unusual especially mm-hmm. for a place that would get snow because those kinds of flat roofs cause a lot of problems um, mm-hmm. in snowy locations yes Shumblin made the, this point that if you want to create an atmosphere for manifestation of evil spirits make the building somewhat trapezoidal in shape. And he noted that the trapezoid could be on the roof. It could be the whole building. He mentioned the John Hancock Tower, which is the black building on the left. Uh, He said that that, those two spires on the top, which I'm sure are some kind of communication, you know, antennas. He called them the twin horns of Lucifer. Um, (laughs) And he said- Probably not wrong. No, probably not. (laughs) He said that this building, which, you know, is much wider on the bottom than is the top, that trapezoidal shape I've got on the right, um, is, you know, is designed to bring in evil spirits. He said that that building had a mass number of suicides and mental health problems with it uh, when they first opened it up. I don't know if they've kept track of that over time. So that was interesting. Wow. The, the roof on the end is the same kind of shape. The upper right-hand side is another building he mentioned, which is the Adams House. And you'll see those sometimes on old old buildings, especially like ones that seem haunted. <laughs> and yeah. there's probably good reason for that if it's yeah. bringing in all these evil spirits. So I thought that was an interesting, that was an, just an interesting connect. All right. Well, it is, and uh, and it's it's sort of mind blowing to me too because um, that Baraboo Inn uh, is reputed to be haunted, and yeah. they have made much of the fact that it is haunted. Yeah, um, and they have events there. Um, I think um, that place, and I think maybe even at the Al Ringling, they're like doing seancey type. So, I mean, there's <laughs> yeah, but th- they make a lot of the the ghosts and the hauntedness of the Baraboo Inn. So yeah. fascinating. Well, that doesn't doesn't it makes sense to me now if that if that roof is designed or somehow you know brings in evil spirits. He made a yeah. point too. If you look at the and I didn't put this on here, but if you look at the um, pyramid on the back of the dollar bill, it has that kind of it's more elongated vertically, but has that same shape and it's got the the capstone oh. removed, right? Oh, sure. It's, so that pyramidal shape uh, um, with the, the top off, the, the triangular top off of it is also deliberate. 
Oh, which sure. That's shape for bringing in evil spirits. Great, right? Because we have it all over our fiat currency. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> oh, I wonder if you can collect evil spirits on paper currency. God, and I hope then not. Again, then again, I, I might not want to know the answer to that. No, I think I might not sleep. <laughs> The first part of this video was recorded in early April 2024, and it was originally much longer. Thorny and I decided to make the recap portion a standalone episode, which is why it cuts off abruptly. Between April and September of this year, I discovered a few more very interesting tidbits about the name Baraboo. Going back to the information we were given, that the two O's at the end were actually Hebrew Samex, in doing the editing of this recording I thought to myself, well, if those O's aren't actually part of a word, because they're not English letters, I wonder what Barab might mean. Sure enough, after plugging the word Barab into Google Translate, it came up as brothers in the language Sesotho, which is the official language of South Africa and an unofficial language of a few other regions in Africa. Then I went back to Google Translate a day later and tried it again, and to my surprise, it did not translate to brother at this time. Weird. So I looked up the word brother in a Sesotho dictionary, and brother didn't translate to Barab there either. If I set Google Translate to brothers in English translated into Sesotho, it comes up as B-A-E-N-A, -A, which corresponded to the Sesotho online dictionary. So much for Google Translate. Thorny and I kept looking, and she found an interesting history of the word Barab, which in Hebrew derives from Ba and Rav, meaning son of the teacher or son of the master. This translation goes well with the Brotherhood's understanding that high-level individuals are descended from Jesus Christ, who was often called rabbi or teacher. This concept that Jesus was married and had children is an occult story commonly called the Jesus Strand. Whatever Barab actually means to the Brotherhood, we don't know, but it's such an unusual root word that we figure it must be significant. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and Thorny and I will be back in 2025 for some more interesting decodes on Baraboo. See you next time.